Good evening. Welcome everyone tonight to the 2015 version of the Pollock Lectures. My name is Jody Clark. I'm the academic dean here, and I'm also your flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> the washrooms are located, you know, it's really critical because we have no, thank you all for coming to here instead of the chapel, but we have no water in the chapel currently. And so that's the, the, the migration up from the chapel. So thank you for adjusting to that. So the washrooms are located on my right, your left, you go down the end of the hall. There are also washrooms above. And there are actually people from the residence coming in. So there may be lineups for the washrooms, <laughs> just so you know. It's a sacred thing. You know? it's good. So that's a bit about the life of AST. We've had a very hectic day today. And they're digging up our front, our front lawn. And God knows what they'll find there, right? Um, so, uh, really, seriously. It's kind of scary. It's kind of scary. That's good. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you. Um, so three, three quick things again. A very warm welcome. We have St. Mary's oh, over here. St. Mary's, a full contingent of St. Mary's folk over here. Well done, thank you. Full support for our guest speaker. That's issue one. Issue two is, please fill out your evaluation form. There are evaluation forms here. So when it's all finished, excellent is a really important thing. That's all you really need to hand in. So that's item two. Item three is, I love asking for money. Uh, yes. No, I do. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me at all. You know you can do things if you have money? Just saying, right? Church, we try to avoid the issue. Um, if you really like this lecture, we'd like to bring more of these to you. And should you so feel so inclined, feel free to talk to me or any other member of the staff about contributing to our ongoing lecture series. Um, it's a dynamic way of infusing really wonderful ideas into the imagination of the public. So we're really excited about that. And we're excited about tonight's lecture. We're excited about tonight's lecture. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Susan Wilhawk. Susan, in your hands. You have to hold up really high, apparently, just like this. So. <laughs> they don't want to hear me. <laughs> My accent. All right. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's my honor to um, introduce our lecturer this evening, Dr. Margaret Y. McDonald. Uh, just a brief story about how this came to be, if I may. Um, I was, uh, faculty receive a plethora of uh, academic catalogs come across our desk, you know, with textbooks, and we uh, just all the time. And I was thumbing through one of those, and I came across a title that struck me, The Power of Children, The Construction of Christian Families in the Greco-Roman World. And I have an interest in the history of childhood and in early Christian education, so I paused for a closer look. The author was identified as Margaret McDonald, Dean of Arts and Religious Studies, next line down, St. Mary's University. <laughs> My eyes are getting bigger at this point. Halifax, Nova Scotia. Well, who knew? Who knew? So excitedly, as I often have, I fired off an email to the dean, and we must get her over here to AST. Uh, as I learned that Dr. McDonald is an internationally known scholar. She came to St. Mary's in 2014 as dean. Prior to that, she taught at St. Francis Xavier University and the University of Ottawa. She is an honors graduate of St. Mary's and received her doctor of philosophy degree from Oxford University. Her book publications include The Pauline Churches, a socio-historical study of institutionalization in the Pauline and Deutero-Pauline writings. I got that out. Okay. <laughs> From Cambridge University Press. And Early Christian Women and Pagan Opinion, The Power of the Hysterical Woman. <laughs> Woo, amen to that. <laughs> and a very no well-known book, of course, co-authored with Carol and Osick, a Woman's Place, Early Christian House Churches. And her latest book here that I mentioned, The Power of Children, The Construction of Christian Families in the Greco-Roman World from Baylor University Press. Plus, she's authored many 
journal articles, book chapters, and presented many papers at academic conferences, including the Society of Biblical Literature and the Canadian Society of Biblical Studies, uh, which she also served as president in 2010 and 2011, and the International Paul Colloquium in Rome. Uh, Dr. McDonald has a CV to die for. I'm just a little bit starstruck. <laughs> Um, Dr. McDonald has received many research grants, the most recent being for a project on gender and education in early Christian communities. And it's also notable that she received the University Research Publication Award from St. Francis Xavier University. I thought it looked like about 18 years running for that award. Um, and tonight she will speak on making room for the little ones, how a focus on children changes our understanding of early Christianity. In her book, she argues that the bringing that bringing the experience of children to the center of interpretation of the New Testament household codes changes our understanding of those texts controversial because of their patriarchal and oppressive legacy, she says that the codes are more culturally complex than has been recognized and attempts to recover what those teachings actually meant by considering the presence and role of children. Now the Pollock lectures were begun shortly after the turn of the century to honor Dr. Alan Pollock a former principal of Presbyterian College, which was the predecessor of Pine Hill Divinity Hall, a founding party of Atlantic School of Theology. The endowment income from the Pollock Lectures is made available through the board of Pine Hill Divinity Hall, to whom we are grateful for this evening. So it's my delight to welcome Dr. Margaret Y. McDonald. Well, let me start by saying how happy I am to see such a wonderful turnout for my lecture tonight, and it's a pleasure to be here at St. Mary's. Brings back memories. Uh, my whole return to Halifax in my role as dean is full of memories for me uh, because I was a student at St. Mary's, but while I was a student at St. Mary's, I came to AST very frequently. In fact, taught or took New Testament Greek here uh, and have wonderful memories of, uh, Mary, of AST as well as St. Mary's. So as was discussed in the introduction, I'm bringing you, I guess, the fruits of some of my more recent research on really the intersection between studying life, family life in the Roman world and the development of early Christianity. So much of my work has been on early Christian families and how family life developed within Christian communities, which in the period I study was located in house church communities. So the intersection between that, that Roman context of the family world and the shape of early Christianity. So what I'm doing in my newest book is focusing specifically on children. And in a sense, what I'm doing in this book is what has been done earlier, especially with respect to the lives of women. What happens when you read texts when you bring women to the center of the investigation? Well, in my project, I was asking, what happens when you bring children to the center of the investigation, in particular when you consider some of the very brief references to children, but important references to children in the texts that are known as the household codes, which I'll talk about in a little while and give you some more background. But I'm going to start with an imaginary scene. And these scene, or actually there's a couple of scenes here, um, come straight from my book, is sort of setting the stage in terms of the feel and shape of communities and how children might have 
been present in these communities and how this might have influenced the life of the community. So in the middle of the first century CE, in ancient Colossae or Last Odyssea, a group of believers in Christ is gathered in the house of a woman named Nympha. And you can see that Colossians 4.15. Her house is a modest peristyled house or domus, a building with a colonnade, but the interior courtyard is large enough for an assembly of about 50 people to gather. It is the same space where earlier in the day children had been practicing their singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Newcomers have listened eagerly to the rejoicing and are eager to be taught this spiritual wisdom, Colossians 3.16. But now people are making an effort to listen quietly with a slave caregiver doing her best to settle the toddlers in her charge. A letter from the Apostle Paul is being read aloud in the midst of the assembly, Colossians 4, 16. Slave and free children are sitting side by side and are addressed directly, being told that they must obey their parents in everything, for this is their acceptable duty in the Lord. Colossians 3.20. Older slave children already aware of the confines of their servitude and constantly reminded of the authority of their masters, Colossians 3.20-23, are nevertheless surprised to hear a comforting message. Like freeborn sons and daughters, they will receive their inheritance from the Lord, Colossians 3.24. Not too far away in ancient Ephesus, a father is teaching spiritual, scriptural traditions, Ephesians 6, 2, 3, to his children, along with the stories he knows about Jesus, Ephesians 6, 3, 2 to 3. But these children are not only born to his wife, but also include the slave children that live in the house and the children who are playmates from the neighborhood. Some are orphans, street children, with very uncertain futures. Not only is he a father and head of the household, he has become a pseudo-father, bringing up all of his children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. A few decades later, one of these well-raised children is being recognized as an overseer bishop in the community, 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. His deep roots in the church tradition are celebrated, for he is no recent convert, 1 Timothy 3, 6. An apt teacher, 1 Timothy 3, 2. He is emulating the household leadership he learned from his own father. He too will keep his children respectful and submissive in every way. At the same time, one of the most prosperous women in the community is hosting a group of girls and young women in another household, 1 Timothy 5, 16. Her teaching and mentoring influence has also been recognized in helping younger women make the transition from childhood to married life, motherhood, and the management of believing households, Titus 2, 3 to 5. The young women are quick learners and are eager to discuss some of the new community teachings that place limits on their activities. A widow herself, the woman has considerable sympathy for the young widows who wish to remain unmarried and devote themselves to ministry. Perhaps, she thinks, community leaders are overreacting to some of the tension with neighbors that has resulted from efforts to win new, neighbor, new members. Today the topic among the gathering of older and younger women is the young male evangelist, 1 Timothy 4.12, who addressed a group of children, including many adolescent boys, awaiting their teacher on the steps of the theater. He claimed to be following the example of Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.1-5, but may have been imprudent. He encouraged the children to go along with him to the shops that were adjacent to the house owned by the wealthy widow in the community where they could meet other believing children and learn more about the Lord. Since then, rumors have been flying that the community is overrun with foolish women and slaves who corrupt children and encourage the disobedience of legitimate figures of authority, fathers and school teachers.
The women are worried that this young evangelist is actually making it more difficult to reach out to the children in need. So these early church scenarios are fictional, but they're nevertheless based on the research I did for my new book. So this is a book about children and childhood in early Christianity, and it's based on more than a decade of research on family and early Christianity. I've been one of a number of scholars interested in understanding the influence of family life on the development of early church communities. Communities that used houses or apartments as their primary meeting places. Communities that did not establish dedicated meeting places in the terms of either converted houses or new architecture for almost 200 years after the time of Christ. My presentation tonight is divided in three parts. I will begin with some introductory comments about New Testament household codes, which are at the heart of my study. Then I will discuss some important aspects of the background of children and childhood in the Roman world, followed by a discussion of a few specific texts. So one of the best places to really feel the influence of family life on the New Testament is to read what is called the New Testament Household Codes. These are some of the most controversial passages in the New Testament. New Testament ethics contained in these rule-like statements about family relations have come down to us, known as household codes, but they reveal the presence of children was valued in early church communities. So in your handout, the very first text is an example of the household code. It's the shortest, briefest household code in the New Testament, and it's Colossians. And I'll be referring to it later on, but if you're not sure what a household code is, you can just read that text, Wives, be subject to your husbands. And you'll see the different family groupings that are addressed. Set within the context of family life in the Roman world, brief references to children in Colossians, Ephesians, the letters to, to, to Timothy and Titus gain new significance. Moreover, the treatment of slaves in early Christianity should not be examined in isolation from the treatment of children. Slave children and slave parents and caregivers were members of the early Christian audience and played a role in the development and growth of early Christianity. Early church literature reveals an interest in the socialization of children as a means of preparing the community for the future and as part of efforts to articulate its identity. More and more, this concern for socialization became an explicit interest in education. Moving children to the center of interpretation of household ethics in New Testament brings one to the heart of church communities. These groups combine elements of household and school existence. It's quite ancient, really, to think of early Christianity as a type of philosophical school, but it's rarely been considered as an important educator of children, and especially the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, give interesting evidence in that direction. Ultimately, a focus on children leads to a greater understanding of how early Christians combined their faith and commitment with family life. They challenged, but also adopted, many features of the society in which they lived. The household codes almost always refer in one way or another to children or the reality of parenting. And all the texts, I could read you the numbers, but they're in Colossians, Ephesians, 1 Peter, 1 Timothy, Titus, also Ignatius's letter to Polycarp, and Polycarp to the Philippians in the first few decades of the second century. These texts appear at the end of the first generation, either in the last stages of Paul's ministry or soon after his death, and continue to make their presence felt until about the middle of the second century. These texts illustrate the importance of family matters in New Testament times. For some, no doubt a welcome correction to the Paul of 1 Corinthians 7, who seems a little too ambivalent about marriage and the survival of the household. 
But among the most controversial features of the household codes is that they offer unmistakable evidence of the acceptance of the institution of slavery as a reality of early church communities and more generally of the shaping of early Christianity by its Roman context. Such teaching embarrasses and offends contemporary sensibilities no matter what spiritual values can be detected as infusing these rule-like statements. But to understand the meaning and legacy of these ethical codes, it's important to understand as fully as possible how they would have been heard in their own time by a diverse audience that included children and slave children. And when slaves are considered in early Christianity, until recently, little attention has been given to child slaves. It is not possible to erase the patriarchal or oppressive effect of these codes throughout history. But to understand this New Testament teaching and some of the surprising implica implications for its own day, we must allow for an awareness of the interaction of the ethical instructions with the complexities of family life in the Roman world. And we think our family lives are complex and multifaceted. The Romans equally as complex, if not more. Household codes created organizational structures that facilitated relations within the community. Various factors were at play. For example, against a rising tide of asceticism involving measures to control physical appetites and to contain sexuality, which can be detected, especially in Colossians and in the pastoral epistles, the household codes offered community integration to married members within the house church. Some early church teachers called for the rejection of marriage altogether. In contrast, the codes concretized a stable family identity which supported the rearing of children. This teaching had deep cultural roots. The references to the three pairs of relationships, the parent, the, sorry, the uh, husband-wife, um, slave-master, parent-child relationships, represent at both an adoption and an adaption of common advice found in discussions of household management from ancient Greek times to the Roman imperial period. It's also important to remember that when New Testament teaching appears most closely to emulate societal ideals and seems overly conventional and bourgeois, there's a bigger picture to keep in mind. This was a group that was increasingly viewed as suspicious in the eyes of outsiders and would be persecuted sporadically by the beginning of the second century for disrupting society and its cornerstone, the family. Admirable family identity, one of the marks of respectable citizenship, was lived out, this is the bigger picture, in a group whose societal alienation had been replaced by citizenship with the saints and members, membership within the household of God, quoting Ephesians 2.19. When children are brought to the center of interpretation, a central question must be asked. While acknowledging the infusion of Christian elements such as references to the authority of the Lord, do any of the household codes reveal evidence of significant change or challenge to the status quo? Do the household codes simply reinforce the traditional role of parents, or do they reshape them in certain respects? <coughs> Particularly significant is that the direct address to subordinate groups has been identified as a distinctly Christian innovation to the household codes. So what's at least very unusual, if not distinct, and scholars argue kind of both sides, is that it isn't the father who's addressed to um, discipline his children, although he is doing that and he's told to do that only. The children are addressed directly as if they're there, present in the community, listening when these letters are being um, uh, read. And maybe even more significantly, slaves are addressed directly. Household management discussions from classical Greek times to the New Testament era certainly refer to relational pairs and often treat each member of the pair reciprocally. But the direct address to subordinate groups, as if they are listening members of the audience, especially to slaves, is unusual, if not unique. 
The much more usual pattern is to address the head of the household directly, the implication being that this household head, as husband, master, and father, would guide and direct the other subordinate members of the household. Thus, despite the fact that a great deal of similarity exists between the household codes and discussions of household management in the ancient world, no precise parallel exists to addressing subordinate members in this direct manner, at least that's been discovered so far. The circumstances of various members of subordinate groups should not be considered in isolation from members of other groups. Structures of domination have been shown to be comprehensive and interlocking, extending beyond the patriarchal and gender-based system to include elements of race, class, and colonialism. What this means for an analysis of the place of children in household code teaching is that the circumstances of childhood cannot be separated from the conditions of oppression caused by slavery, hierarchical marriage, or imperial might. In short, the relative brevity and conventionality of the New Testament household codes, despite the relative brevity, the household codes operate in complex ways. The codes are culture-affirming, but also include some counter-cultural elements. With respect to countercultural elements, perhaps the greatest attention has been given to the promise of inheritance from the Lord to slaves as a reward in Colossians 3.24, which takes on a new poignancy with recognition that under Roman law, slaves stood outside of the realm of inheritance altogether. Really, the whole parent relationship, slaves um, having children, was not recognized in law at all. There was no patrimony, there was no inheritance, and um, we, have, we see in some of the monuments that slaves, former slaves managed to erect where they, they created new family structures, they celebrated their family structures as if they were legally recognized. How, how difficult and how important it was to be able to create that lineage. Very important in the ancient mindset and slaves were banned from being able to see their families like that um, in, in any way that was legally recognized. However, here we have this concept where slaves are being told it's spiritual inheritance, but it's still inheritance. Um, they are, th that's exactly what would have happened in every church community. <laughs> uh, it is crucial to investigate uh, what the presence of such a realm of inherit, what, what, a, what such a promise could really mean when delivered in tandem with a call for slaves to obey in all things that directly reinforces structures of domination. If only freeborn children might actually inherit, one must reflect upon what inheritance from the Lord actually implies for the life of a believing slave child. So some background, some further background on ancient society. The child-parent relationship plays a central role in household management discussions of the Greco-Roman world. Several aspects of this thought are of particular importance for understanding the New Testament household codes. Of fundamental significance, and my slide il illustrates this to a certain extent, children themselves belong to a somewhat nebulous category. So in our society, we have definite benchmarkers around age when you can drive and age when you can vote. And it seems like in the ancient world among the Romans, the end of childhood, the beginning of adulthood was really a lot more flexible. And also many, many times what we would consider uh, when we read a text, it sounds like it's an adult. Really from a biological point of view, what we're talking about is is really uh, a child. Um, childhood was a flexible concept rather than one that was rigidly determined by biological age in the Roman world. And an interesting text to consider is the one here I have on my slide. Now concerning virgins, um, I have no command of the Lord, but I give you my opinion as to one who, who is by the Lord's mercy trustworthy. So. Um, this is Paul talking about marriage and whether or not you should remain celibate. And if anyone thinks he's not behaving properly towards the Greek word is virgin, if his passions are strong, so it has to be, let him marry. Now, people reading this text today would probably think, 
that's, you know, a young couple, a young married couple. But we debate when girls might have been married uh, in the Roman world for first marriages, but it was very often to older men. And although depending which class, and there's debate, could be ages 12, 14, 15, what we would consider an adolescent. And this is reinforced, like for example, by rituals, Roman rituals, where the night before a wedding, a girl would sacrifice her dolls. So there's a lot of transition that would have happened from childhood to married life in particular for girls and women that must have been abrupt, uh, that required coaching, and very different from what we would think about. So who is a child? Who is an adult? This is a question that we want to ask when we look at these texts, and also the more flexible concepts. Sometimes when children are mentioned, actually adult children are in view, or expectations concerning the attitude of children to parents that continue into adulthood are intended. In addition, children are certainly required to obey, but their obedience and the consequences for disobedience is viewed as fundamentally different in nature from that required of slaves. The dominion of parents over their children is typically understood as a key indicator of pietas, often translated as piety, perhaps the most important virtue in the Roman world. This is something the Romans shared with the Jews. Obedience, respect, care for parents into old age is an absolutely fundamental value. This virtue combines emphasis on submissive, obedient behavior with notions of family loyalty, citizenship, and deference to God or to the gods. So if early Christian communities are converting adolescent boys, say, and against the will of the head of the household, this is a very, very serious um, breach in terms of the normal state of affairs. So this emphasis on loyalty to the household is both something that early Christians embrace they actually also defied it, I think, in um, significant ways as they expand it. So important is this virtue that it can override concepts of justice and parent-child relations. For it is sometimes necessary to acquiesce to the unjust will of a parent for the sake of one's pietas. Among Jews and Gentiles, parental authority can be expressed as akin to divine authority, even though there were also clear calls for moderations in the exercise of discipline. An interesting example from the classical Greek era, 4th century Athens, of the household management discourse, which is often compared to the household codes of Xenophon's uh, Economicus, which likewise treats marriage, the management of slaves, and the child-parent relationship. Much of the text is reported as a conversation between Socrates and a married householder, uh, Iscomachus, illustrating the relationship between economics, household management, and agriculture. Of special significance is the way it presents intergenerational bonds between parents and children. Iscomachus presents his wife as capable of managing household affairs independently while he occupies himself with outdoor pursuits. Her skills stem from both the education she received from her parents and from the formation he himself provided upon their marriage. That's another model you see of husbands as teachers of their young wives. He admits that she was young when they married, not quite 15, and that she would inevitably have much to learn. But he also states confidently that she's been carefully raised to control appetite and self-indulgence, which is the most important product of education of the young for both men and women. Here we are introduced to concepts that are important for the interpretation of this material, household code material in the pastoral epistles. Marriage of women, when they were by our standards still adolescents, means that a fluid relationship existed between childhood and adulthood with associated responsibilities. In Xenophon's treatise, the young wife is like a child. To be instructed, an ongoing education continues well into the early stages of marriage. Think of Titus 2, 3 to 5, where older women are to instruct younger women. Without denying the existence of patriarchal structures, male and female authority over household could be presented as taking distinct but equally important forms. We also see this in um, 1 Timothy. The wife's household management is compared to that of a queen bee who sends forth those with outdoor responsibilities, manages the stores of what they bring back, presides over the fabric carefully constructed cells, and is the guardian of the youth who are nursed and reared under her care, but who are un 
unhesitatingly sent forth when they're ready for work responsibilities. With this analogy, Iskomakis communicates the control of his wife, the central role of his wife, in the circle of household life. Her role should strengthen with age as her hair turns gray, for she is to gain even greater honor. That must be what happens to deans, I think, as my hair turns gray. <laughs> uh, she gains great, greater honor as a mistress, wife, and mother, with increasing skill as a guardian of the home, helpmate to her husband and children. Think of 1 Timothy 5, 9 to 10. Although there are some subtle differences, most of the senti same sentiments about pairing and children were articulated in household management material for the next several centuries. A good example comes from Dionysius of Harlequinassus, where if you listen to his um, language, you can see what he says and how it parallels Colossians. Um, he talks about the superiority of the Roman position over the Greek, and he notes that the laws concerning women by Romulus were excellent, but those he established with respect to the reverence and dutifulness of children towards their parents, to the end that they should honor and obey them in all things, both in their words and actions, were still more august and of greater dignity and vastly superior to our laws. The same terminology with respect to children occurs in Colossians 3.20, which instructs children to obey their parents in all things. And while it's contained within a scriptural reference, honoring parents is encouraged in Ephesians 6.2. In Colossians, wholehearted obedience in all things is also required of slaves. And the links between slavery and childhood with respect to to authority and obedience call for careful reflection. So within a century of Dionysius of Harlequinassus, and about the same time as the New Testament works were composed, the Jewish author Josephus created an apologetic work against Apion, and I believe you have a little bit of that on your handout on the second page. I think you can follow along there. Um, where the obedience of children also figured prominently. This emphasis on proper rearing of children played a role in responding to, to accusations that Jews were disruptive and antisocial. So jo Josephus says, above all, we pride ourselves on the education of our children. And I think that's an amazing claim. This is a Jew writing to a Roman audience, at least largely defined, defining Jewish identity. And he says, above all, we pride ourselves on the education of our children and regard as the most essential task in life the observance of our laws and of the pious practices based upon which we have inherited. Now this is followed by a statement that in terms of the law orders all offspring to be brought up with prohibitions of abortion and infanticide in response to Greco-Roman practices which were viewed as anathema to the Jews. Josephus wishes to illustrate that the law is even more severe than practices of other nations, so that among Jews the mere intention of doing wrong to one's parents against God is followed by instant death. Now that's, you know, exaggeration to make a point, but that's how he frames it. The association of the obedience of children with piety, um, let me, the, and parental authority with divine authority is completely conventional in the ancient world. Among first century Jews, an arguably even stronger expression of equivalence between parents and the divine is that made by Philo of Alexandria, who says, quote, parents are midway between the nature of God and man and partake of both. Parents, in my opinion, are to their children what God is to the world. Now, whether parental authority receives the same kind of divine sanction in the early church household codes and what this might mean for children in the community is an issue that requires careful consideration. But here's a point to consider. Human authority is quite clearly presented as secondary to the authority of the Lord in early church household codes. Both parents and children stand side by side under the authority of the Lord. Because, and we see this especially in 1 Peter, the early church sanctioned wives to join the church without their husbands. And that clearly places the authority 
of the husband secondary to the commitment that's made in allegiance to the church. So that must have got them, well it did get them in a mess of trouble. The cultural negotiations required are inevitably complex, for the household code spoke to audiences which sought divine sanction for rupture within the family. So while all of this is going on, there's another whole theme that I could have been examining on how early Christianity was accused of rupturing the family. Tension and even breakdown in relations between wives and husbands, slaves, including slave children and masters, and most probably also children and their parents are all within the realm of possibility. Few interpreters have really probed the significance of the direct appeal to children in Colossians and Ephesians. Admittedly, the references dealing with the child-parent relationship are brief, but two reciprocal verses in Colossians 3, 20 to 21 expanded somewhat in Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. But these texts leave us with no doubt that children were present in community gatherings where Pauline letters were read aloud. And we know from Colossians 4, 16 that the community was encouraged to have someone read these letters aloud. So they're not meant to be read silently. They're meant to be proclaimed aloud and listened to and called out for exhortation. The parent-child relationship was valued. That was something that could be shaped by life in Christ. These verses, therefore, are far more significant than their length would suggest. The presence of children in early church groups was of central importance to the atmosphere and mission of early church groups. We need to consider how early church instruction would have been heard by children and how a recognition of the presence of children might transform our vision of interaction in early church communities. In addition, we must move beyond a simplistic analysis of the categories of the household code. Three points concerning overlapping aspects of familial identity need to be made, which have not always seemed obvious. First, slaves must have included child slaves. Secondly, not all children from households were from households headed by, children, by Christians. And we see a couple of direct references to that. Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, we have mixed marriages, where Paul is talking about one member bringing a child or children to church. We see the mixed marriages in 1 Peter. We also see in 1 Timothy, slaves whose masters are not believers. So these slaves have somehow made it into these communities. So not all children in this broader group were, had a Christian pater familias. And thirdly, in a house church context, and this is very different from our own setting, it would have been virtually impossible to exclude the presence of children. You know, Paul, whose maybe views on children might seem a bit ambivalent, because he really does prefer celibacy and time is running out, but he uses all kinds of birthing me metaphors, children metaphors. It doesn't refer too often to children specifically. That 1 Corinthians 7 is probably the only spot. But they would have been everywhere under his feet, whether he, where he was at work, um, even if, if households, a household of slaves was gathering and they had formed a believing community, children were not secluded in the Roman world. They would have been pretty much everywhere. Uh, there's no separate playrooms archaeologically that have been discovered. A real sense that, in fact, and I'll say a bit more about this later, slaves who would be looking after children would have brought children of free parents into their um, whole social world. So they're everywhere um, in terms of the physical space. It's generally accepted that household code should not be understood as a straightforward description of what was actually going on. But it's also crucial to come to terms with the fact that the categories themselves fail to reveal overlapping identities. References to slaves would naturally include children, and references to children would by necessity refer to the slaves, also slave parents. Slaves formed varying degrees of stable family alliances. Slave couples could be, at the whim of the master, separated. So it's a very real question for early Christianity as to, to what extent it protected slave marriages and slave families. The children of believing slaves would often have shared service to believing masters with their parents. 
Likewise, children of non-believing masters may have accompanied their parents to church meetings without the permission of their masters, placing them in an extremely vulnerable position. Thinking of 1 Timothy 6, 1-2. The presupposition that slaves must include child slaves is also based on shared living spaces for free and slave children. Roman Ephesus and Pompeii offer little solid evidence for separate slave quarters. This means that slaves probably slept wherever they happened to be working or serving their masters. Kitchens, storerooms, the floor of a master's bedroom are all possibilities. Wet nurses and caregivers were usually slaves who reared young, free, and slave children together. All children, therefore, um, would have shared the same spaces during the day, and free children frequently became temporary members of the slave familia. Ancient sources speak of both free and slave children being present at celebrations such as banquets and weddings. We must even be prepared to think of slave children being assigned ritual roles that grew out of their work as servers, readers, and entertainers. Not only do the household codes mask the reality of the shared world of free and enslaved children, they form a camouflage to children who were members of households headed by non-believers. While they're rarely taken into consideration, it is almost beyond question that early church communities welcomed these children. As early as 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 16, the presence of the children of one non-believing parent is presupposed. We don't really know what's going on with that text, but here Paul encourages believers to remain married to non-believers as long as the non-believing partner is willing to stay together. There's nothing to indicate whether believing wives, husbands, or both are in view, but later church literature refers almost exclusively to the woman being the believing partner. The brief reference to children, this is a picture of a birth um, labor uh, picture, where slaves were often midwives. Um, the brief references to children, 1 Corinthians 7, 14, points to the presence of, or at a minimum, consideration of the children of mixed marriage who are now considered holy and we would do well in imagining these children as having believing mothers who brought them to church gatherings. The use of familial language to refer to slave alliances in ancient commemorative inscriptions means that we cannot rule out the possibility that the children of mixed marriage included slaves. 1 Timothy 6, 1-2 refers to slaves who live under the authority of non-believers, and children should be considered part of this group. In addition, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6 offers indisputable evidence of the presence of women married to unbelievers in the community. These women were also mothers, raising the question of whether their precarious situation was caused by the fact that they not only betrayed their husband's oversight over the religion of the household, but encouraged their children to do the same. A comprehensive vision of family life in the Roman world, including how families lived in a variety of domestic spaces, allows one to move beyond a literal reading of the household codes. It is vital to give in-depth consideration to various possible identities of the children, members of believing families, children of mixed marriage with one parent as a believer, neglected children who made their way into a meeting without parents or slave children, including adult slave children, who may have been the biological children of their masters. It's crucial to consider how particular circumstances affected children who heard these codes. It's also essential to reflect on the identity of parents who may have been pseudo-parents in the Lord rather than biological parents. The relationship between childhood and slavery should be of prime interest. And among the many aspects of this relationship that needs to be considered is the inscriptional evidence to suggest that some children were raised with the expectation that one day they would share in the promise of the free children of the family. They're actually relatively unusual, but the inscriptions from Rome on your handout give some of that evidence where in particular the last one, the longer one on the bottom, shows you where a free woman has 
raised her own child with a slave playmate and they both died unfortunately and here they're commemorated together but they're presented in such a way to sort of um, say that the slave child was going to be raised uh, as a free child with all the education that would come along with that although that is really <coughs> unusual however keep in mind the promise of inheritance in Colossians in addition to sharing of domestic spaces by slaves and free children. Slaves and free children also shared educational experiences with slave caregivers, often acting as the first educators of children, which with much education taking place at home. The emphasis on education and socialization of children in household cold tradition calls for an examination of the house church as the locus of Christian education. Be they slave or free, the sons and daughters of believers or non-believers, one must assume that when early Christians met in households, children were present. Children seem to have penetrated virtually every social space. The archaeological record does not support notions of separate playrooms or bedrooms for children. Simple two-room dwellings above shops, which might well have served as a meeting place for church groups, would simply have children, including crying infants and toddlers, as a constant presence. So in church, when there's family services where kids are allowed to make noise, I think that's very close to what was going on in early church communities. The story in Acts of the youth, Eutychus falling asleep, is one of my favorite stories, at the window of a dwelling in Troas, when he's listening to Paul, he's like, you know, a young guy and he's bored out of his brain, and he falls asleep, he falls to his death almost, and then Paul cures him. It's one of my favorite, best insights, I think, incidental kind of insights into what this was like, crowded and hot in a small room and people listening to the message of the gospel. With respect to lower glasses, classes, the neighborhood and the street was the playground. Children were also everywhere to be found in elite spaces. Even if our own inclination might be to think that the bigger the space, the greater the chance the child would be sequestered. That doesn't seem to fit with Roman evidence. Architectural plans and grander houses were open. Children were mobile within them, ready to witness every activity. So now, turning specifically to particular documents, starting with Colossians. And I know I'm almost out of time, so I'll just give a brief overview. Consideration of the perspective and circumstances of slave children can change our understanding of Colossians 3.18 to 4.1. The longer treatment of the slave-master relationship in this text is meant that it has received a good deal of attention, but virtually no attention has been paid to the presence of slave children and slave parents. In trying to understand how the institution of slavery can be supported by this text, while at the same time presenting a community vision of unity and the breaking down of barriers in Colossians 3.11. This is one of the most bizarre things about Colossians, is that like Galatians 3.28, it presents this vision where barriers are broken down between slave and free, and then a little while later in the document, you have a call for slaves to obey their masters. It's helpful to be aware of the circumstances of slaves within the family. Slaved act, slaves acted in several pseudo-parenting roles as wet nurses, caregivers, attendants to schools, all of which must be kept in mind in analyses of the slave constituency of early Christianity. Slaves were involved with the child care of free children, side by side with slave children, raising questions, I think, underappreciated, difficult to get at in the text, but seemingly almost inevitable given the structure of the Roman family, of the evangelical influences of slaves, as well as the implications of slave children being called out side by side with free children for instruction in the Lord. Temporary membership in the slave community was commonplace, but the consensus was that any semblance of equality between playmates would end definitively in adulthood. So. As much as kids played together, as soon as a free child was an adult, that relationship changed forever and fundamentally. And that's what the, the Roman texts want you to think. What happens in the early church? Slave children were barred from inheritance and slaves had no rights to patrimony. Such considerations give new meaning to the promise of inheritance to slaves in Colossians 3.24. There's no doubt that a promise 
re which refers to future salvation and ultimate status before God is not the same as erasing social barriers completely. But in the Roman context, it nevertheless stands out as a shocking promise. These early communities were clearly not eliminating the structures of slavery, and in many respects they reinforced the structures with appeals to the relationship between the Lord and the community. By placing children at the center of the investigation, however, suggests how community action may have been transformed. Now a second source of humiliation, and really resonates in our own time, which I talk in detail about in my book, is the sexual use of slaves, including slave children. The focus on sexual ethics in Colossians 3, 5 to 7, which includes many general terms for sexual vice, raises numerous questions about how moral standards could be applied in a mixed community of slave and free members found in a society that simply accepted the rights of masters to make sexual use of their slaves, any slave child, married or not. So slave children could be adopted as favorites, pet, they were given a name sort of like pet children, um, and sometimes this was for sexual gratification. There is no explicit treatment of the sexual use of slaves in the New Testament including Colossians, although scholars have thought about some of the language in those terms. But the theological implication of the promise of inheritance to slaves, coupled with the definition of a baptismal status involving a newly transformed identity, which is also bestowed on slaves, implies an ethical imperative that warns against believing masters making sexual use of the slaves of the community. It probably continued because it was a cultural pattern, but there's enough evidence, I think, to suggest that this was um, discouraged in early Christian communities. And there is some later evidence in the patristic era that, that is more explicit. The sexual violation of enslaved peoples was a prime means of demonstrating their dishonor. So that was a, a clear way that you showed that your people, the peoples were enslaved or subjugated in the Roman era. One could not bestow the slaves of the community with honor as being renewed in the image of God, according to Colossians 3.11, and continue to support their sexual use. I had some comments about Ephesians, but I think I'm going to skip over a little bit of Ephesians and talk finally about the pastoral epistles. Um, which, both of which emphasize education. With many points of continuity with Ephesians, the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, acknowledge the presence of children more boldly and attribute greater significance to their behavior. The emphasis on education of children, which is linked to family relations in Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, becomes more pronounced in the pastoral epistles. Much more explicitly than in Ephesians, the education of children is surfacing as a communal responsibility. The education of children is tied to leadership structures, including the burgeoning church offices and depictions of the ideal teacher. The teaching of children, though, is a role shared by both men and women in the pastorals, however, even if heavily influenced by traditional gender expectations. The blueprint for this state of affairs can be detected in the manner in which authority of Paul's delegates, Timothy and Titus, is constructed. Paul bestows authority upon Timothy and Titus as his heirs. He is their fictive father, and they are his children. No mention is made of the real father of these figures. However, and this is intriguing, female members of the immediate family are clearly important. It is the example of women, a grandmother and a mother, that anchors Timothy in the faith, according to 2 Timothy 1.5. Lois and Eunice are presented here as setting the stage for Timothy's ongoing formation under the guidance of Paul. As in Ephesians, maturing in the faith throughout the life course is highlighted. The significance of motherhood is presented and in the celebration of, uh, at least indirectly, of married life in Ephesians, but in the pastoral's motherhood and grandmotherhood is recognized for its educational potential. Together, mothers and the fictive father Paul prepare the delegates to represent Paul to teach his message. In turn, the delegates set in motion leadership structures that embrace the educational potential of parental relationship. For example, Timothy will go on to instruct the 
local overseers to be ideal fathers. The presentation of the teaching capacity of women is one of the most fascinating features of the pastoral epistles, especially given the unmistakable attempt to circumvent certain teaching roles for women. Mothers are instrumental in the education of both sons and daughters. The educational activities of women were controversial in the Roman world, and frankly, the acceptability of the educated woman increased the more closely it was tied to family life. Thus, for example, there's a sustained celebration of the heroic educational achievements of elite mothers in relation to their sons, often as a result of widow widowhood. So taken together, though, 2 Timothy 1.5 and 3.15, um, where Timothy has been introduced to scriptures from infancy, clearly place women in the position of teacher of the youthful Timothy. But it's important to recognize also the many conventional features of this presentation. Lois and Eunice are like the noble widows of ancient literature who make sacrifices to ensure the education of their sons, passing down valid, valued traditions and learning. At the same time, however, an appeal to ancient conventional motifs masks counter-cultural reality. Lois and Eunice are presented as having prepared their young charge for a role in a suspicious religious group, which does not match the ideals about the erudite male. Moreover, the lack of reference to husbands and fathers in the case of these women leaves open the possibility of women defying their husbands and joining church groups without permission and teaching the children scripture and church traditions from infancy. Like mothers, the educational influence of fathers is also reinforced in the pastorals, both within the immediate family and within the house church community. In the case of fathers, however, this educational influence is linked more directly to emerging church offices. As with the teaching concerning mothers and grandmothers, children emerge as a key concern. According to Titus 1.6, for example, the children of elders, presbyters are to be believers, not accused of debauchery, and not rebellious. The text constitutes a strong reinforcement of the authority of elders' fathers and a strong endorsement of their leadership, reminiscent of Ephesians 6.4, but demonstrates further evidence of institutionalization. The elders' presbyters are being held accountable for the religious training of their children. The instructions concerning the overseer as the model householder presume the ideological importance of the role of fathers in preparing the next generation. To a greater extent than Colossians and Ephesians, the pastorals presume a body of educational content and the need to deliver it. The house church is becoming a type of home school. Making more than an effort to socialize members, communities are putting in place structures to educate. The significant interest in family relations with respect to leadership and teaching roles, along with the sustained teaching vocabulary in these texts, suggests that the ecclesia space reflected in these documents often indicates the merging of the household and the school. The expansion of early Christianity continues to be a great subject of interest and debate, and a focus on children sheds light upon a dimension of engagement with the Roman world that has often been overlooked. Small, silent, but listening. Children were absorbing the content of the Gospels, and they would deepen their understanding of the traditions throughout their lives. So to conclude, by bringing the experience of children to the center of investigation, this research has much in common with studies on women in early Christianity that seek to bring women's lives to the center, to move beyond a simplistic view of the lives of women based on male attitudes to women, in, a, in the direction of an effort to hear their own voices. And that's even more difficult with respect to children than it is with respect to women. The lives of children are even more difficult to reconstruct on the basis of evidence in the lives of women, however, for they remain literally silent in our sources. But one may certainly feel their presence, glean something of how they shape the life of how ch churches. In investigating New Testament communities, there is great advances to be made in drawing upon the findings of Roman family historians who have access to a vast array of material remains, including housing, burial inscriptions, iconography, and monuments, all of which offer direct evidence of the lives of children. 
Perhaps most importantly, one gains a new perspective in reading the household codes through the lens of children and childhood. The effect is not unlike what has been seen in the study of early Christian women and gender roles. What at first glance may appear to have little to do with children and childhood turns out to be much more about them than was previously thought. Categories that were once thought to exclude children must now be opened up to include them. Across disciplines, the study of children and childhood is increasingly recognized as a vital component of investigating human experience, past and present. Thank you very much for your patience and listening, and I, I'd be happy to answer some questions. I think that was the end. Good. So we have time for questions. Thank you, Andy. That was wonderful. Um, we think of mothers and fathers and fictive parents and adult slaves and widows and so on as teachers in, in house churches. Right. And I'm really curious about, I'm thinking about children as teachers. Uh, children who model proper behavior might be teaching. Yep. Children who teach younger children household skills could be thought of as teachers. Um, you said that it's notoriously difficult to um, uncover mm -hmm. things about children, mm -hmm. so little said. Yeah. But in your imagination, I mean, Timothy aside, because we really don't know how old he was, mm -hmm. that, but in your imagination, were children teachers in the house churches too? And if so, what might that have looked like? Well, we know that, te the, okay, if you look at the Roman world, we know that teachers, sorry, that children participated in rituals. We know that they were sometimes taught to perform, sing. And how I imagine children acting as teachers, I think, is especially in the task of memorization and teaching other children scriptural verses. Because when you think about it, what does it mean to sing songs quote psalms, They're, these people don't have texts, they're not carrying Bibles. And so how, how is teaching actually going on? A lot of it is repetition and memorization. So what I, I imagine, and it is imagination, taking what little I know from the Roman context, is I imagine groups of children um, being together, um, having certain leaders, both men and women, the bishop overseer, that sounds like a very elevated role, well, I think he's a father in the community, and part of his role is that, you know, his, his children are the model, they're viewed as the model, and his family is the model, and he's actually parenting a whole bunch of other people who are coming along, in addition with his family. So, yeah, I think of it um, that way. I wish I could come up with a text where a child is presented as a teacher. Um, it, it's escaping me. But the whole gospel tradition, I haven't talked about it here, but in my book I have gospel tragic, you know, trajectories from the gospels into this material. And the whole idea, uh, you know, that um, the kingdom of God the children emulate the kingdom of God, and um, the last shall be first. And um, it, there's some challenging texts in the gospel tradition, I think, that, that resonate with a reversal of the norm. The whole idea that the bishop should be despised for his youth is also interesting in the text, because I think sometimes people were probably in leadership roles where by conventional standards, they were viewed as too young, too inexperienced. And that sort of transition between childhood and adulthood and the kind of nebulous quality of that transition, I think factors in as well. But it is interesting to think about child as teacher, and I, I haven't, I'd like to give that more thought. Uh, thank you for that. That, um, that talk, I think the, the line that stuck out for me the most in everything that you said was that there's no archaeological evidence that there were playrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was, huh, that's fantastic. And so therefore, you know, children would have been integrated. Yeah, yep. totally. I think totally integrated everywhere in the and, Roman world. And I yep. think that's something for me that I'm kind of, um, as, a, as a new mom, thinking about the formation of my little one. You know, um, when kids are kind of sent off 
to a Sunday school yeah. and then come back to the Eucharist or, 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 or sometimes don't even come up for the Eucharist. Yeah. Um, or even being invited to be present at things that are, that are really foundational, such as a baptism of another yeah. baby. Um, yeah. Does your book get into any of your um, personal views or any suggestions for how we do a better job? In the modern day? <laughs> yeah. Modern yes. Day. Like how no, we I am so that? comfortable in the ancient world that I. <laughs> Kids think, my kids think I live around the year 120. I have a whole life around the year 120. But, but um, I, t I can give you my own thoughts on that. Um, that uh, well, I had a, a fantastic experience when I was a grad student in a, in a community, a Dominican community, Blackfriars in Oxford, which was had a family mass. I've never seen anything quite like it since because there were Oxford scholars, phenomenal preachers, best sermons I've ever heard in my life. But they had this family mass where really it was totally open except for I think the sermon. They did go out for the kids went out for the sermon. But the kids were around the altar. There was no attempt to, you know, s to remove the life of the child from, to keep it under control, you might say. Um, and that's what I imagine the early church experience to be like. I think on my handout, and I've lost my own handout here, so I'm going to come back here. In my book with, uh, I think it was here, um, uh, with Carolyn Osiek, um, we wrote about this. Um, maybe, maybe it's on my slides, I can't, I can't remember. Um, but I can give you the sense of it. Uh, no, it's not here. But um, we said that we have to imagine toys on the floor, mm -hmm. toddlers being managed by slave attendants. If the early church groups, we don't have archaeological evidence, so I wish I could tell you what it was like in the year 120, where exactly they were meeting. But I imagine a lot of it was tenement. You know, there might have been houses, richer houses where a slave community would have formed. But I tend to think that these were two rooms, probably above a shop. And really, there's, it's all, people are all together, little kids, toys on the floor. There's no, you know, sort of Eucharist being performed where that is pushed away. It's, it's the household. It's the family. Maybe not all church gatherings were like that, but I think probably the majority were. Uh, and that's really interesting to think about in terms of modern communities. It's not my area. Like I said, I live in the year 120. But I do think about, about the possible um, parallels in terms of uh, modern church communities. Yeah. Can I take you back to the ancient world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take me back there where I'm much happier. <laughs> it's, it's, um I, I'm interested in uh, Judaism in the first century. Right. Okay. So, um, can you talk to me a little bit more about your sources? We've got Josephus up there. We've got Philo. Right. Um, I used a great deal because um, from especially Josephus, and what I didn't talk about in Ephesians is, uh, uh, see what happens when you are dean for six months or seven months, you forget <laughs> what you used to do. But I use a significant amount from the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a scholar, uh, Cecilia Vossen, actually, who's published a lot on the Damascus document. And there is an amazing amount of material in the Damascus document about the teaching of children. And I use the Damascus document and some of the material in the Dead Sea Scrolls to compare, especially to Ephesians, because um, it, it, the world view of Ephesians is quite similar in many respects to some of the material in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is becoming more elaborate. But to answer your question, right. no, it, the, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are very interesting evidence, both on women and now on children, which probably maybe surprises people. Josephus says much more about education and children and parenting. Partly it's apologetic, but partly it tells you something about how he's viewing Judaism, how he wants to present Judaism, and how he wants to highlight the education of children as a, as a priority. I think in terms of its stance on children, in most respects, early Christianity was emulating Judaism in how it was, yeah, yeah in how it was constructing its ethics. Around, you know, around children. There's some there's some differences, but very important parallels. 
Well, yeah, it does seem that where the subversions that you're talking about really do seem to come from, from Jewish tradition. Yeah, right. yeah, the teaching of the law, for example, and, and wanting to instill um, from infancy the teaching of the law and scripture. This is a Jewish concept that the pastorals absolutely emulates. Yeah. Well, the idea yeah. that everything's in the house, too. That's right, yeah. that's right, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I'll let you moderate, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm fascinated by the um, ancient world, but the thing that really struck me um, was when you said that these, these women right before marriage would be sacrificing their dogs. Yeah, or presenting their dogs at the hearth, yeah. Yeah, that, that is just one of the rituals. Um, there were many household rites and in the Roman world. Um, and uh, one of the, the, the rituals that was used, I talk about it in my book, is that there was an offering. The dolls would be presented at the, the hearth, sort of, uh, and before the wedding. And it really is, was a kind of marker of the transition rapid transition between, yes. you know, being a girl and then being a mother, for by our standards, often very young. So in the pastorals, what's interesting from the New Testament point of view is that the pastorals present women, older women teaching younger women. And you'll use older widows as role models for younger women that have to be controlled. They sound like very oppressive texts from our perspective. And in many ways, I think they are, but um, there's another side whereby it reinforces the role that was part of the society of the day of mothers educating daughters and also of older women educating younger women. And from the point of view of communities, in terms of church gatherings, I think it's not only gatherings that are taking place for ritual purposes that we would think of for sort of prayer and um, the Lord's Supper and so on. I think there's gatherings that might have been separate uh, that were teaching gatherings that are reflected in these texts where it might be that women are um, gathering together, sort of it was in my imaginary scene, uh, and uh, talking about early church teaching and teaching the, the, younger, the younger women. Younger women are a concern in 1 Timothy. Uh, they, they seem to be adventurous. They, they go out and preach the gospel, it seems, or teach on their own, and they have to be contained, uh, according to the author. Um, and that's part of this picture, I think, that we, that we see uh, in terms of the mixing of generations in the communities. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm put in mind of uh, accounts I've heard of people who spent time uh, with churches in Africa, present-day Africa, oh. and the difference of uh, children there and here. First of all, in Africa, there are tons and tons of children. Children are everywhere so. because the life expectancy is much less. Right. So that's one thing I'm curious, <laughs> the similarities and differences there. The other thing is the church in Africa, the kids sit still and listen for hours at a time, and they can't believe how indulgent we are that we expect the kids will be noisy. And if you have a family service, it's going to be mayhem because kids will be kids. Well. In Africa, kids are... They sit there. They sit listen, there, they're cold, they're disciplined, and they yeah. don't, this, the expectation is they're not going to be noisy, I, and they're going to toe the line. So I appreciate where, where that. Does the yeah. Fit in between the I don't and know. That? I mean, I would imagine that <laughs> that's a really good point, and I, I may have projected my own experience with children on how I imagine Roman children to behave, um, <laughs> which is possible. But you know, what? when you read descriptions of children, especially descriptions of adolescents from the Roman world and the things that we fear about in teenagers, it's really scary because the Romans have noticing the same things. <laughs> so not much has changed. But it, it, it is possible that, and I don't know how we would get at that, to know whether um, kids, little kids, I mean, school age kids behaved in different ways than we experience. And your African example, at, you know, may challenge um, even some of my uh, conceptions. But I think we're safe in saying that that at least children weren't removed, and that the 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 domestic things, you know, whether it's food or. They, they couldn't have re, reinvented their small households for the sake of a gathering. These are within domestic settings. P 
probably by and large. What the other thing that I, I thought you said, your first comment about life expectancy, right? That's very interesting. There's been a lot of study in Roman demography so that the typical family, this we're pretty sure, was not at all like our typical family. In my book with Lynn Osiek, we talked, I talked more, not in this book, but about the you know death of children and how that affected families. Really, most families would have experienced the death of a child. And you, in the demography, it shows us that often families had, like, you know, there'd be a two year old and a 15 year old because everybody died in the middle. And so you had big age differences in families. Um, so that, that is part of the Roman picture. And in the Gospels, where so many people are reaching to Jesus for cures for their children, I think that reflects the reality of. What ancient life was, you know, was like. Um, so the life expectancy, demography, how many children died, how difficult it was to, to, um, you know, to make sure that your child remained alive, um, is uh, is part of the uh, part of this world um, as well, and uh, and how uh, family life, you know, was was affected for sure. Um, I was actually going to make a similar comment to okay. ask uh, how, who you're comparing the children to. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the experience I thought of was uh, in Trinidad a long time ago mm -hmm. at, at an outdoor <coughs> mass, actually, mm -hmm. where you not only had children running around among everybody's feet, but there were chickens and dogs and, <laughs> yeah. and so on. Chickens, and, and yeah. The, the thing was going on, you know, endlessly, probably two and a half hours. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was I'll, I'll have a comment about that. that I had in my mind. And the other thing that came to mind, actually, was, um, you know, being at, um, I know this became a, I was a friend of a lot of Irish people when I was in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And um, remember a family being totally incensed because they were invited to a wedding where children were not invited. Yes. And, um, you know, and of course, growing up in Newfoundland, you went to a wedding or anything that adults went to. There were children everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, it's not a discontinuity in the sense. Yeah. You know, it's more of a middle class, recent thing to have a playroom, for example. Right. Uh, I mean, our house never had a playroom. Right. <laughs> no, I didn't have a playroom <laughs> either. No, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it is a kind of a, I don't know, a class Western judgment. Yeah, right. no, I, I think that's, that's, that's yeah. true. In terms of, this is fascinating, the openness mm -hmm. of houses. And that, I think, is part of the reason why early Christianity expanded the way that it did, is that it's virtually impossible to create you know, secrecy and privacy, because we're dealing with a Mediterranean world. <coughs> we're dealing with courtyards and doorways where people are coming and going, even in elite houses let alone the lower classes, the majority of the people. So there's openness about the whole society. And the, the street is the playground for lots of kids. So early Christianity had many opportunities to, um, to reach out and to, you know, just in a very way that people were living. The pagan critic, I guess I didn't have it on my slide, but the pagan critic uh, Celsus or Celsus, when he attacked early Christianity, the first sort of systematic attack in by an intellectual about the year 150, uh, he talked about early Christians targeting school children and adolescent boys and telling them to go along with foolish slaves and women to to shops where. Um, people are working. And so he, he really picks on the, the defiance of fathers and legitimate teachers as one of the things that early Christians do and why they should be shut down. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. And it was Origen wrote a response if you're interested in looking, in looking, looking it up. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Um, on your screen up there, you had a kind of sentence about uh, Lucian. Uh, yeah, that's another one. Uh, pagan yeah, yep, yeah, that's right. And um, he accused um, the early church of consisting of old hags. Yeah, yeah, the derogatory. And, and orphans. Yeah, 
Yeah, derogatory term for yeah. all women. And, yeah. Um, and, and I think that a lot of people might say, well, that's what today's church. <laughs> <laughs> by their grandchildren, right? <laughs> so my, my question is, I guess, yeah. is that such a bad thing? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I mean, the whole presence of older women in terms of widows, I didn't touch much about it. It's because wrapped up with, with um, the care of children is really interesting in the early Christian tradition. And that's a case where um, you have them paired with orphans. And there's another great one, the Shepherd of Hermas, where there's a female figure called Grapte, and she's told, this is early second century, to teach the orphans and widows. And it may be that some of the older women are grouping together in communities, um, maybe it's one more well-to-do women, and they're looking after kids. And that this is also sort of a cell a type, I call it a cell, or a grouping that exists in early Christianity. Ignatius has the virgins called widows, which is, a, okay, how can that be? That doesn't seem to make sense. But it, I think it may be a grouping of younger women, adolescent girls, maybe who've chosen celibacy, along with some of these widows. So older women play a, a major role, I think, and the care of of them sometimes becomes controversial as in acts and to a certain extent as in the pastorals. And they are some of the people that are grouped with, with kids. Yeah. Perhaps one more question. <laughs> Going once. I just love the image of women and children subverting society, you know. <laughs> what a great revolution. Yeah, yeah. No, I think in early Christianity that that, you know, there's a case to be made, at least that's part, that's one dimension. They were certainly viewed as doing that. Good. <clears throat> Nobody grabbed that last one question, so it's gone, sadly, for the evening. <laughs> you, you look quite settled in, and we could go on for hours, I'm sure, but that wouldn't do justice to us, nor to our speaker. Um, it's been an extraordinarily rich light, night tonight. One of the things I think that's really marked the night is that uh, um, I always like, as a researcher, to look at things what isn't here? What don't we see? And then what do we see? And what you did, I think, tonight was pull into view something that's so painfully obvious and yet so painfully invisible. So you did that so graciously. And I, I, I feel like I'm going back. I can't wait to get home tonight and start rereading the pastoral letters, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> Which a lot of people really find boring, but I no, don't. No, I can't. <laughs> well, suddenly I'm excited about going and reading them tonight. So, uh, because it lifts things off the page, and, and you did that so graciously. So, so thank you so very, very much. And once again. Okay.